But this NPR podcast and the following message come from Delta Airlines. Now enjoy free mobile messaging while flying on Delta. You can use iMessage, WhatsApp, and Facebook Messenger simply by logging in to the in-flight Wi-Fi. From WHYY in Philadelphia, I'm Terry Gross with Fresh Air. Today, David Simon and George Pelicanos, the creators of the new HBO series The Deuce. It's set in Times Square in the early 70s when it was a center for pimps, prostitutes, and peep shows. And pornography was about to become a big business. Simon and Pelicanos also collaborated on The Wire and Treme. They'll talk about the research they did for The Deuce. Are we going to admit on NPR that we, we had to buy a first great pornograph and put it in the middle of the office? And yeah, we looked at what we were depicting to be certain. They say they've tried to depict the sexual exploitation of prostitutes without exploiting the actors who play them. You're trying to restrict the camera's use as a, as a titillating agent. You're not trying to light to make it more erotic or more pornographic, but you can't merely allude to what pornography is. That's coming up on Fresh Air. I'm Ophira Eisberg from Ask Me Another. Every week we play nerdy games with contestants and celebrities. Hear Patrick Stewart dramatically read Taylor Swift lyrics or learn how many quills there are on a porcupine. Find Ask Me Another on the NPR One app or wherever you get podcasts. This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. All right. Everybody drinks on me, okay? What do you have? That's James Franco playing a bartender, serving a clientele of pimps, prostitutes, cops, criminals, and businessmen in the new HBO series, The Deuce. My guests are the series creators, David Simon, who also created The Wire and co-created Treme, and George Pelicanos, a crime novelist who wrote for both series. The Deuce is set in Times Square beginning in 1971, before Disney moved in, when 42nd Street was a center of prostitution, adult bookstores, peep shows, and movie theaters. The series follows the pimps and prostitutes who work the streets, the cops who patrol them, the mob that's trying to expand there, and the city government leaders who are trying to figure out what to do about Times Square. The characters don't know it yet, but the porn industry is about to take off and become a big business. James Franco stars in two roles, Vincent, the bartender, and his near-do-well identical twin brother, Frankie, who's gambled away his money and is in debt to the mob. Maggie Gyllenhaal plays a prostitute who has always refused to work with a pimp and is hoping to get out of the trade by learning to make porn films. David Simon, George Pelicanos, welcome to Fresh Air. Congratulations on the deuce. So lots of people know the Disney version of Times Square, the current version of Times Square. Remind us what it was like in 1971, the year when the deuce begins. Um, We start in 1971 on this show, and at that point, the middle of Manhattan, the Midtown area, uh, was really given over to a lot of vice. It was, of course, the theater district, but that was coexisting with a lot of uh, depressed real estate, a lot of um, prostitution, uh, some street drug trafficking. It had become uh, a New York that seemed to be failing in some very basic ways. Two of the main characters in The Deuce are identical twins, both played by James Franco. Vincent runs a bar that caters to a lot of cops and sex workers, um, and his brother is a gambler and, uh, you know, someone who's always getting into trouble. They're based on two real identical twins who I think you met, or at least you met one of them? Well, we met the character whose name is Vincent on the show, the bar owner, and um, his brother had passed, and and he actually passed away before we shot the pilot. But uh, David and I spent a good deal of time with him, and um, it was his it was his stories that and his delivery in in uh, in a way that got us interested to begin with. You know, we didn't particularly want to do a show about pornography, and we almost grudgingly took the meeting with this guy. Um, but after we spoke to him, the story started to come alive for us because he knew so many people. Their arcs were so defined. And this bar that he had um, was an unusual place for, for that time because, you know, at the time you had uh, segregated bars. You had the gay bars downtown. You had black bars, white bars, that kind of thing. He welcomed everybody into this place. So he knew um, uh, prostitutes, pimps, porn actors, you know, politicians, journalists, gay and straight, 
transgender. And he was the kind of guy that, um, although he was complicit in a lot of the things that we're going to get to on the show, uh, he had a live and let live, live attitude. So, um, and the fact that he had a brother uh, that was sort of not a bad guy, but he dragged him into a lot of bad situations created conflict which was you know natural for drama for us so you like this guy um i would say i like a good bit of him yeah right <laughs> Fair i enough. mean the, you know yeah. he's problematic he was problematic in certain ways mm -hmm. but there was a lot of charm to him i will say but then you know at the same time there were moments where you know he would tell us a story about somebody and and we would say well, well what happened to her and, and you know, the answer was never that she married a, a podiatrist and moved to Scarsdale and had three kids. It was always the vast majority of the stories were attritive. And so you started to get that vibe as well. So um, the series is also about pornography and how pornography is changing. And I want to play a short clip here. There's a scene where one of the prostitutes, Darlene, finds out that one of her Johns has kind of ma not only made a film of them having sex, but he sold it, and it's being sold under the counter at the local bookstore that has a lot of porn that it sells under the counter. And so she goes in to try to get her hands on one of these films and find out who's making money off of her surreptitiously like this. So here's uh, Dominique Fishback as Darlene and E.J. Carroll as the bookstore owner. Hey, Moon. Darlene, what's your name? In a movie of myself. I heard you running in the machine over there. Could be, I don't know. And I'm guessing you got copies people can buy, too. I'll have to check the inventory. Do that. Uh, yeah. I only have two left. You're very popular. Backdoor, Betty. How much you sell these for? 50 to chumps, 35 to regulars. Why? Where do they come from? Who puts them out? Oh. What are you, an owl? Whose movie is it? Charlie, what do you want, an address? I don't know. You don't know. It may have heard, but it's illegal to have sex for money. And uh -huh. it's illegal to sell pictures of people having sex for money. I mean, cheesecake, you know, okay. But the hardcore stuff stays in paper bags. I can't even put it out in the store. So, oh, not a sensible question for me. Where do you get them from? I get them. Uh, take them you want. I don't care. Go. Go. Buy one back for me. Ten bucks. Jesus. Uh, it's the least you can do. Oh, I'm just listening to the sound of the cash register. <laughs> <laughs> the, the ringing and the drawer closing. <laughs> and it's a, that's an anachronism, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. I love the, that guy's voice, the, the guy who's the bookstore owner. Um, yeah, it, he was great. Yeah. Any, anyway, so uh, tell us what the laws were at the time. Like he's talking about how it's not only illegal to sell sex, it's illegal to show people selling sex. What are the born laws at the time, 1971? Well, you, you couldn't show penetration, basically, was the big one. Mm -hmm. um, so even the machines, when you went into these places, they had to be, they were supposed to be edited so that that was not, was not being shown. And, um, and the movies that were out, you know, it was almost okay if it was a foreign film and, and it was under the guise of a, uh, of a documentary like Sex USA or, you know, before that it was I Am Curious Yellow and all these, um, Swedish films that, um, but if it was a, if it was a narrative, if it was a story where you were showed people having sex that was uh, that was illegal and then it busted out you know all of a sudden it became it became fine to show these things did the laws change not really um, this was sort of an ambiguous period and to hear the people who were involved in pornography tell it it was kind of like we'll push a little further we'll push the envelope back a little further we'll sh we'll see if this flies if that flies one of the big uh, moments, I think, for uh, uh, New York was it was actually a gay film uh, called Boys in the Sand, which we, 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 we make reference to and we actually show uh, a clip of in, in the piece, which is there was, a there was a hardcore 
gay film made on Fire Island in 70, 71, 70, I think it was, and uh, exhibited in 71. And it played in an art house. And for whatever reason, it was, I guess, because, you know, they had Ravel and and some other composers. I mean, it, it was sort of, you know, it, it, it kind of was artfully filmed, uh, despite the hardcore content. Um, it, it managed to sustain itself in a regular theater for eight, nine, ten months in New York. And... You know, anybody who was at the edge of the skin trade sort of looked up and said, how are they not getting raided? And it was it was one of those first moments of, man, nobody can really tell the difference between what's obscene and what isn't anymore. It's not it's not the old um, adage, the old Supreme Court adage of we know it when we see it. And so once that became an open ended debate, a lot of judges, a lot of Superior Court judges in New York were were not going to sentence you uh, for an obscenity case anymore. Once that happened, it, it fell to. Uh, the community standard logic. And, of course, places like New York and San Francisco had much more lax standards for what they were willing to tolerate than other places. And uh, th- that also brings up an interesting point about the nature of the of the content. Um, at, at this point in time, people, uh, filmmakers, pornographers, actually had artistic aspirations. You know, they were, um, they wanted to make good porn movies. And so you had films like um, uh, a little bit later, Behind the Green Door and uh, Devil Miss Jones, and this was after Deep Throat. Um, and, of course, the funny thing is now is that we've reverted back to the, to the roots of pornography, meaning if you, uh, if you get on your laptop and look at porn, it's basically 10-minute loops that go right to the money shot. They've given up on any art, you know, aspirations for art. But um, it went backwards. Well, you don't you don't need that to justify it anymore. <laughs> and I don't think so. No, not I, at I think all. people watching not at, at home they just want to kind of get to the point. If well, they, if they it, want to plot, they'll watch it became, the deuce. It became <laughs> you know a, I mean? a it became a v- vehicle for sexual release. I mean mm-hmm. that ho- that moment of porn chic when when uh, some of the people making the films uh, had this one window of believing that they were on the way to creating some some new genre of cinematic genre um, it was a very brief moment. And you could probably time the end of it uh, uh, to the, the arrival of, of VHS, of, of videotape, because at that point, the entire physical plant of places like uh, the Deuce or North Beach in, in San Francisco, it became irrelevant. You didn't, you know, the, the raincoat crowd was no longer... The audience. The audience was the American people, and by and large, the American male, and it was going to his living room. Well, let's take a short break here, and then we'll talk some more. If you're just joining us, my guests are the two creators of the new HBO series, The Deuce, David Simon and George Pelicanos, who have also written some of the episodes. We'll be right back. This is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Swell Investing, an impact investing platform that aims to deliver profit as well as purpose. Swell identifies high growth potential companies that are working to solve today's biggest challenges like clean water, disease eradication, and renewable energy. Now people can invest in portfolios of stocks that align with their values. This is impact investing. It's also good business. Invest in progress at swellinvesting.com. So the Maggie Gyllenhaal character um, is like the only prostitute in the series, the only sex worker in the series who refuses to work with a pimp. If someone's going to pay for her services, she's going to get all the money. She's not going to give some of it to a pimp. She fills in for a woman in a porn shoot, and um, she gets very interested in how is this put together. The film that she's making, you know, that she's appearing in, this porn short, it's such a ridiculous film. It's like the women have blonde braids and they're kissing each other and then naked Vikings walk in. So the naked, <laughs> naked guys walk in with Viking helmets and horns coming out of the helmets. Um, well, it is, it is called Great Dane in the Morning. So. <laughs> 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 yes, porn, porn always has great titles. Um, so anyways, we're, we're the most of the – did you watch a lot of porn films of the era – and were they mostly as ridiculous as the one that you have in the deuce? <laughs> Not that we're, we're I intend watching. to put you on the spot. We're looking at each, we're looking at each other. And, <laughs> Who's going to take this answer? Are first? we going to admit on NPR <laughs> that we we had to buy a first 
great pornograph and, and put it in the middle of the office. And um, yeah, we did look at, uh, you know, we looked at what we were depicting to be certain. Um, and uh, I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, I think we were about 11 and 12 in 1971. But by the late 70s, when uh, when New York was sort of at, at the height of this stuff, George and I were teenagers. We, we've, we're American men. We probably have acquired a certain amount of pornography, I think it's safe to say. Um, so we're aware of what we're, what we're depicting, even what we're uh, sort of remarking on at points in the show, of course. But, yeah, I think the point that we were trying to make in that first moment uh, in the second episode was that uh, Maggie's character of Candy is encountering the basement variety of of how loops were made before um, before even what they called the the one a day wonders. Um, this is this would, is this is Latin. There's a lot of people won't be familiar with loops. One one day wonders. It's like, a it's a guy it's a guy shoot minimal props. He's shooting it in his basement in the Bronx. He doesn't even have sound. He's right. not running sound. Mm-hmm. Um, it is it is as close to like an eight millimeter home movie as you could. You know, he's got a little bit of lighting, and, but he's using an eight millimeter camera, and, and he's um, He's, you know, you, you had to develop it either in your own bathroom where you were using a mob run lab that used to put these things out. But these are not feature films. These are not anything that was intended to go anywhere but into a home projection camera or into a uh, peep show. And um, that was sort of the, the, the prime logic of, of pornography until it was able to come out of the shadows. And you can tell the women in this short film – are f- are faking it they're they're not even they don't even know h- how to make it look real if you know what it, it looks just like so everybody's going through the motions but so when you were young and watching things like that and you could tell this is like a really cheap badly made production everybody's faking it but still they're naked and engaged in sex as artists yourselves <laughs> you know um did you have this kind of disconnect between like the quality of the film <laughs> and the sensations it was arousing in you? Uh, Terry, when I was 11 years old in 1971, I was trying to steal my dad's Playboy and figure out like, you know, what was going on. So, I have to say at a certain point, you know, the the idea that uh I was looking in any way at pornography in any kind, of, you know, I was on the way, even in high school, to being a newspaper reporter. George was going to be a novelist, so I don't think we were looking at like looking at any of this stuff cinematically. We were just trying to figure out the mysteries of of what we didn't know. Um, you know, I mean, I think in retrospect, now looking back on on what pornography has become in in, in American life, how ubiquitous it is, and what is at a ten or twelve or fourteen year old kids fingertips now on the internet um, that's interesting to me the idea of how blunt and and how uh, frankly misogynistic a certain portion of that pornography is and how available it is um, because it was all uh, you know it, it, whether it was pornographic or, or erotic or anything it was all weirdly forbidden if that's a word when I was a, when I was a teenager, it was you know, I mean I don't think I saw that George. I'm speaking for myself, but I don't think I saw a porn loop until I was 18 or 19. You know, I had to, I had to be of age to walk into a dirty book. That's store. right. Your turn, that's George. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Give it up, George. <laughs> uh, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a big part of my life. I can tell you that. I mean, we had theaters in D.C. Uh, we'd go, you know, I'd go down there with buddies of mine occasionally and. And check it out, but you knew what what it was. I mean, it was you weren't looking for production values, um, <laughs> and and that's that's pretty much the case of all the exploitation movies I used to see, and you know, uh, the, the karate films, black exploitation. You know, it was just it was another way to have fun. Um, grindhouse, yeah. yeah, grindhouse. I mean, uh, but I didn't I didn't think about it that much, and I didn't, and I sure didn't think about you know, in the back of my mind, I might I might have thought, well. That's somebody's daughter, or that's somebody's sister, you know, and uh, but that was the extent of my, um, you know, my self reflection. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I have to say, in this cheap movie that we're talking about, within the Deuce, 
the money shot is executed with the help of Campbell's <laughs> potato soup. <laughs> <laughs> can I, is that can a real I just thing? Say, is that a real thing that happened? Is that you know, like Richard based Price, on research? Yeah. <laughs> Richard Price wrote that. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he researched it. Apparently, um, apparently, it was an early remedy. Uh, if 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 the male performers had performed uh, too quickly, um, it was uh, it was a substitution, and uh, and he put that in there and. Um, it stood the test of time. It made it through about three generations of scripts, <laughs> and uh, the cast and crew managed to execute it in such a way that it, it did speak to the amateurishness. And also, bluntly, it spoke to what people were chasing when they were when they were buying pornography. And mm-hmm. and and I don't think that's changed. I, I don't think you know. I don't think uh, somehow we've reached some fresh level of maturity when it comes to pornography. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I mean, I think what we were trying to give you was a baseline of what was happening in people's basements before, because you're about a year away from $100,000 in mob money being spent on Deep Throat, which would open with a red carpet at the World Theater in hmm. New York and would be treated to a variety review and taken. It was a joke. It was... It was a farcical plot. It, I mean, we now know there was a, there was a you know uh, we now know the the trauma of 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 the actress who was Linda Lovelace. We know a lot about it now, but at the time, it was also taken quite seriously as the beginning of something because it made an awful lot of money in in theaters, and uh, and so it was it was attended to as a moment, by a lot, and a lot and a lot of notable people went to see it. My guests are David Simon and George Pelicanos, the creators of the new HBO series, The Deuce. We'll talk more after a break. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Lyft, reminding listeners that they could be relaxing in a Lyft ride right now with their eyes closed, listening to Beethoven or whale sounds or a babbling brook or something else relaxing. Lyft provides rides as relaxing as the buttery smooth voice of a public radio announcer because riding is just a more relaxing way to drive. Lyft, it matters how you get there. Download and ride today. So you're working in in difficult territory in making the deuce beat because it's a series about women being sexually exploited by their pimps, by the Johns who, who pay for them, by the cops. Um, by the pornographers. And by the pornographers. So, like, you're in the position of making a series about women who are sexually exploited. You're going to be showing them naked. You're going to be showing them having sex. How do you do that without continuing to exploit the actresses playing the exploited women? Well, David and I worked on this for two or three years before we shot any film. And... Um, it was continually on our minds. How were, were we going to approach it? Um, and it went from conception to to shooting to the editing room, you know. And and sometimes we'd be in the editing room and we'd say, you know, the camera's lingering on her breasts. Let's take five seconds out of that. Um, but the other thing is it also uh, that we did that I think was very helpful was that we surrounded ourselves with a lot of women on the creative side. And so uh, the writer's room is um, has women, you know, very good uh, female novelists that we have, uh, Megan Abbott, Lisa Lutz. Um, Michelle McLaren directed the pilot and the last episode. In fact, um, half of our directors were women in an industry where it's, I think the figure is 15 percent. And um, the, many of the department heads and our creative partner, uh, Nina Noble, has been um, – with David's for you know twenty years, was was there with us every step of the way, keeping us honest, as were all these other people. Can you so, give us an example of one of the discussions or debates you had about how to handle a certain scene or what to show and what not to show? Well, this might give more insight. You know, when we have these things called tone meetings, when a director would come for uh, an episode, and of course there would be sexually explicit scenes in every episode because. As you point out, that's what it's about. It, this is about 
sexual commodification and and uh, and and the misuse, and the use and misuse of women. So we would get to these scenes, and the one thing that we kept telling them was the camera. I'm much more interested. I used to I used to use this. I said, okay, you've got some scenes on a porn set. I'm much more interested in a moment where the food run comes and the sandwiches come for everybody and they're standing around dividing up the sandwiches than I am in the moment where the camera is recording people having sex. That doesn't mean that there aren't moments where we have to, for purposes of story, uh, depict the sexual activity. And it doesn't mean we're trying to avoid anything. It's trying to make all the moments neutral, that there's as much character development in what happens between the shots as there is in the actual sexuality you're depicting. At the same time, and and this is really important, I think, is you're trying not to have the camera linger, as George says. You're trying to restrict the camera's uh, use as a, as a titillating agent, as 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 an exploitive agent. And so you're being really rigorous about what you're you know, you're you're, you're trying not trying to light to make it uh, uh, more erotic or more pornographic. You're not trying to uh, capture. Um, pornographic tableaus. Um, you're, you're chasing other things with the camera. But the other thing that you cannot do is you can't merely allude to what pornography is. Because if you do that, if you start getting, you don't want to be prurient, but if you're Puritan as well, now you're saying something else. Now you're cleaning it up. Now you're taking what is pornography and what its uses and purposes and intent is, and you're making it into some off-screen joke it becomes lighthearted. Yeah, you're on your way to making Pretty Woman. And in some ways, if you're going to do a piece that is explicitly about the sexual commodification of women, that that's what it's about, then you have to show what that is. And you have to show um, what it is and be direct about the fact that that is a very coarse product and a, and a very painful. So I think there's um, more of an awareness now of sex workers as having like jobs, um, you know that sex work is a is a job that there's such a thing as harm reduction, so that for people who are sex workers, like there's ways of preventing of helping them prevent getting sick, getting STDs, and I th- think there's more of an awareness now than there was in 1971, and more of a language for talking about that now than there was in 1971. Although in 1971 there was the beginnings of an awareness of that. So I guess I'm wondering which lens you wanted to see the story through, through the lens of today or the lens of what people were thinking in 1971 or both at the same time? Um, I I think we wanted people to speak as they do in 1971. And again, you and I and George right now are having a discussion about theory and, and, and issues and, and things that if, 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 if our characters were to speak this way, we would have a, a real problem. We would not have a, a functional or credible narrative. That is so true. But, and so I think the thing that really appealed to me, and it started to appeal to me even as we started to hear uh, this man's stories about 42nd Street, was here's a moment where an economy and an industry comes into being almost overnight. Uh, what isn't legal, what is furtive, what is being sold out of car trunks and, and from under counters suddenly is available. And the profit is going to increase geometrically to where now pornography is a multi-billion dollar business. So let's follow that. Let's take a look back at this moment and see who paid the cost, who was, you know, what happened to the pioneers, I mean the real pioneers. And so I think that's what is anachronistic in our heads is that like I think we know what was coming in terms of of the next 30 40 years in America. My guests are David Simon and George Pelicanos, the creators of the new HBO series The Deuce. We'll talk more after a break. This is Fresh Air. Thanks for listening to Fresh Air. Here's another podcast you might enjoy, The Ted Radio Hour. It's a show exploring new ideas and inventions fresh approaches to old problems, and new ways to think and create. You can find the TED Radio Hour with host Guy Raz on the NPR One app or wherever you find your podcasts. So it's interesting, the time that you're writing about, 1971, which is when the deuce starts, 
it's all these kind of coinciding uh, movements. You, so you, you've got this like um, th- pornography is about to expand and enter the mainstream in a way that it never has before. At the same time, you've got the women's movement, you've got the gay rights movement, you've got the anti-war movement, um, you know, the counterculture. All of this stuff is is happening at the same time, taking the culture in different directions at the same time. So how how do, do you want to address all of that simultaneity? There is one character already who <laughs> has nearly gotten fired for being against the war and for for being a college student against the war on a construction site. Yeah, I think that was a, a surrogate for actually Richard Price. <laughs> uh, being, you know, coming near to being escorted off of his father's, uh, I think he was that. I think Price was that apprentice. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we want to get to a good deal of that. If they give us um, the the piece is intended as a three year arc, and if if they give that to us, we would be coming back in the late seventies, and then we'd be coming back in the mid eighties. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Uh, you know, for eight episodes in each sequence, and there's a lot that is about to happen, yes. Um, Women Against Pornography is about to explode and become That's right. reality. That's right. In this, in this specific place, in, in Times Square. Um, and in fact, uh, one, of the character, one of our characters, uh, in, in a you know, fictionalized, but in, you know, in truth, in non-fiction, you know, non-fiction sense, was one of the founders of that movement. So we're sort of prepping for that, for that moment of natural conflict between two fundamental ideas, one of which was sexual liberation and the idea of obscenity becoming a passe notion in American society and the other notion being, um, you know, what does it mean when when women are objectified to this degree? David Simon, when you were a reporter in Baltimore, did you ever cover the police who were covering Vice? Sure. So did you um, work in any things you learned about the sex trade from your years as a reporter? Did you work any of that into the deuce? Um, maybe a little here and there. Um, I mean, Baltimore has a block. We have a red light district. Um, we all kind of knew what happened in the um, in the back rooms on the block, you know, and, and uh, that, that a lot of the dance uh, clubs, a lot of strip joints um, basically could act as brothels. Um, there was certainly a number of street street walking strips. There was a there was a male hustling strip on you know it was part of the the culture of the city um, that this existed. It's part, it's same as in D.C. on Fourteenth Street with you know this D.C. that George grew up in. I think to be honest, when I was in my twenties and covering it, or even in my early thirties, I considered it a little bit of a joke. I don't think I thought about it with any uh, degree of effort. You have to remember, Baltimore was in the throes of. Um, uh, you know, a great epidemic of violence related to the drug trade. So that seemed to me to be the sin, the great sin. And this seemed to be a, a, a vice. And I, I sort of knew the difference and concentrated on the one. And I think I took the other one a little bit lighter. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if that's changed at all, I mean, I think I thought, well, this should be legalized and rationalized and regulated. I think I had that sensibility about it. But you know what? I thought that about the drug trade. So, um, You know, the idea of prohibition seemed uh, impractical. But I will say since then, in doing this piece, I've probably had more occasion to think about the lives of sex workers seriously than I have in, in you know, the previous, all the previous years of adulthood. Did did you meet a lot of sex workers as research to talk with them? Some. So, I mean, we've had people, we have consultants from sort of every aspect. Mm Mm-hmm. Who we work with and we deal with, and we you know we vet the scripts and we we talk and. Do you have an example of something that you learned from talking to sex workers that you wouldn't have realized without that conversation, that was a helpful insight for the deuce? When you talk to some of these people, it's just some of it's horrifying, and 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 everybody you know people have a different perspective on their own lives. So we we have talked to people who have said to us in effect don't feel sorry for me you know i've had a good life i'm i'm empowered all of that yeah um but you know there's been there's a lot of attrition too and um 
And, you know, without being a moralist, I mean, I know that the libertarian wing of the people is – many are for, you know, the legalization of prostitution, for example. And, but, you know, th- there's also a lot, plenty of slavery involved in this, people coming – brought to this country, working off their – working off their uh, their ticket here in the form of prostitution and against their will. and. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not a lot positive that you can say about it after talking to folks who are in the industry. Yeah, I, I think we, we tended to get more positive feedbacks from some of the survivors of, of early porn. Um, I went to a I went to a memorial service for uh, Candida Royale, who is a early uh, adult actor and filmmaker um, who passed away recently, and I, I met a good deal of her um, her colleagues. And I do remember having a conversation where I was starting to talk about, you know, what we had heard in terms of, you know, this bad outcome or this, you know, that that it was an attritive lifestyle. Um, And somebody, actually it was Veronica Hart, uh, it was the the actress Veronica Hart, said, you know what, you can't generalize and be careful about generalizing because you will come across people who they made a life, they were self-actualized, they controlled their bodies, they did it their way. She made a point. She said, the only time I ever had anyone try to get me on a casting couch was in straight movies in L.A. You know, that never actually, I didn't sleep with anybody I didn't want to sleep with um, when I was working in porn. And she was adamant that we not come up with one particular version of events. Mm -hmm. And so it made me wary. If you're just joining us, my guests are David Simon and George Pelicanos, the creators of the new HBO series, The Deuce. David Simon also created The Wire and Treme. Pelicanos wrote for both of those series. We're going to take a short break, and then we'll be right back. This is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from the Showtime documentary series, Active Shooter, America Under Fire. This documentary series presents a new perspective on some of the worst tragedies the U.S. has seen including Columbine, Orlando, and Aurora. Hear firsthand personal stories from responders, survivors, and the ordinary people who performed extraordinary acts of courage. Active Shooter, America Under Fire, an eight-part documentary series, every Friday, only on Showtime. Um, The clothing is so 70s. And one thing I have to say about the clothing, um, and... uh, I don't mean to sound old-fashioned or anything, but I'll just come out and say it. I was noticing Saturday night as I was walking down a street with a lot of clubs on it that all the young women were dressed as if they were in the deuce, as if they were like the prostitutes on the on the deuce with the very short shorts and um, the midriff tops. Um, and, I, you know, I don't mean to sound like prudish or old-fashioned, but like... That kind of clothing is just what people wear now. You wouldn't well, see somebody wearing that and go like, oh, they must be a prostitute, uh, as you might have in 1971. And that, and that's something we also hope to address both subliminally and I think there may be points where it actually can – we can actually reference it. But, but I think mostly you're going to have to get it you know, uh, looking, looking in retrospective from, from today's world, which is this, that, that porn itself – even beyond the actual pornography, even beyond the actual dirty movies and the dirty pictures, it changed the way we look at ourselves, the way men look at women, the way women respond to um, the reality of what, what's in you know, men's brains at this point. We don't sell anything without using the tropes of pornography. We don't sell beer or cars or blue jeans without in some way referencing a lot of what has become normalized imagery um, and normalized culture through through the, the ubiquity of pornography over the last 50 years. It's been a long time. It's been half a century that this stuff has been in the ether. And in, in the same way that early pornography certainly took a lot of its tropes from mainstream film and, and played with them, um, it's it's gone the other way. And now, I mean, I think, you know, for everything from fashion to... Uh, to music, to to to, to regular cinema, um, the, the pornographication of America uh, has been profound. I mean, you don't listen. You don't have a multi-billion-dollar industry operating every year, 
and not have it transform the way we think about ourselves and each other. And I don't think anyone's got a good handle on on, on the depth of that. I, th- I think it's happened so fast and it's been so unexamined. So w- without any, I don't think anyone's examined it with any degree of seriousness. That I'm, I'm not sure we know what we've built. I feel like we can't let this interview end without talking about Taxi Driver for a moment. <laughs> because <laughs> Might tra- as well. Yeah, Travis Bickle's always driving through his taxi past Times Square, probably past some of the same locations that you're trying to summon up even though you didn't shoot on location because Times Square looks nothing like it used to and there's right. no way of there's no way of changing that. But there's one shot in particular from episode 1 where I thought, okay, that's Travis walking down the street. It's um um James Franco is Vincent walking down the street and you see all the movie marquees and there's lights behind him and I thought like that is direct quote from Taxi Driver. Yes. I think Michelle uh who did a remarkable job uh, Michelle McLaren of directing the pilot and, and, and her finale for the first season. I think she went into a room with every single New York film from the 70s. You know, I think in that sequence, you not only have uh, references to Taxi Driver, I think when you see his, Saturday Night his shoes. Uh, Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> exactly. You yeah. see his Absolutely. shoes on the pavement. Yeah. Um, it was her first chance to shoot something in New York. And George gave her the note that we wanted this thing to feel like it was found in a vault, having been made in 1971, that it wasn't the 2017 version of that New York, that it was it was shot with the same tonality as if it had been made then. Yeah. And, uh, and she took that to heart. You know, that area of Times Square has always had a lot of movie marquees, you know, movie theaters, and you know, particularly in the early 70s when more people went to the movies. So uh, I'm always interested in the movies that you have on the marquees. <laughs> and <laughs> in episode one, among the films you have on the marquees on 42nd Street is The Conformist, which is a, a great Bernardo Bertolucci movie. And it's it's kind of like a – it's a very very much an art film in a lot of ways. And then Mondo Trasho, which is a John Waters film from 1969. It's the film he made before Pink Flamingos. I think John Waters once told me that one of his dreams was <laughs> – <laughs> wants to have one of his movies play in a Times Square grindhouse. Was this you making his dream come true? Partly, yeah. I mean, it, it did play in New York. I'm not sure which theater, but um, that yeah, that was a sort of a nod to John. And um, but most of the, most of the uh, what you see on the marquees is actually what played, and the double bills are are with the exception double. of maybe Mondo Trasho. <laughs> with that exception, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> And you know, so at the time, it wasn't it wasn't just soft X's. It was, you know, grindhouse films and art films like the Bertolucci film, and we were pretty careful about that. Even, you know, to the point of making you know, some films were re released with different titles, and I always made sure that it was the original title at the at the time of the release. But you know, we went after um, realism in all aspects of the, you know, the art direction, costume. Cars. We really wanted to get it right. Um, the '70s films that I cut my teeth on were my favorite films. The, those time capsule, you know, movies shot in New York, locations, not sets, like French Connection, Taken to Pelham, One, Two, Three. Some of the black exploitation films, like Black Caesar, which shot in Harlem. Um, we really wanted this to look like a film that had uh, had been shot in '71. And put away somewhere and just got rediscovered. This is where George is totally in command. Uh, nothing is more entertaining than going to an outdoor location for the deuce and watching George uh, march up and down the lines of cars until he finds the you know the 1973 Eldorado that should not be in the line for 1971. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like you know. What do you think you were going to get that opera window past me? You know, like nothing is funnier. It's it's he's you know. Tyrannical. It's just wonderful. George, I'm assuming it's you who chose the theme for the deuce, the Curtis Mayfield song? Yeah, good call. Um, <laughs> you know, Mayfield was a hero, personal hero of mine, just, not just for his music, but his spirituality and how he, he stood up in a peaceful way to the, the, uh, the horrible things that were happening to, uh, to his people at that time. And so um, that particular cut was the first track off of his uh, solo album, Curtis, the one where he's in a, wearing a lem- lemon yellow suit on the cover. And it was sort of the, the shot across the bow of the uh, 
psychedelic funk movement, um, and it's a great song. So it's almost like I <laughs> I achieved a lifelong ambition to get a Curtis Mayfield song in the uh, in the credits. And of course, he did the songs for Superfly, which is well probably like the most famous of the black exploitation films. You know, I uh, I had an eight track deck in my Camaro, and I had um, I had three eight track tapes. You know, I was on a budget, and one of them was Superfly. Uh, the other two were um, Led Zeppelin One and Al Green's Call Me. So mm. there mm-hmm. it is. <laughs> once on the wire, once on the wire, I tried to uh, stage a comic moment to. Um, uh, I think it was either Superfly or it was uh, Pusher. It might have been Pusher Man. Yeah. But uh, uh, George came to me, uh, closed the door to my office, and said that if I went ahead, if I proceeded, he would have to leave the show because while it was okay to make fun of the theme from Shaft, which we'd done in an earlier episode, if I made fun of Curtis Mayfield, he could no longer work on the wire. <laughs> that's true. That's true. He, that's it is true. true. <laughs> So let's hear it. This is Curtis Mayfield from 1970, and it's now being used as the theme for the deuce. But first, I want to thank you, David Simon and George Pelicanos. Thank you so much, and congratulations on the series. Thank Thank you. you. David Simon and George Pelicanos created the new HBO series, The Deuce. Episode four will be shown Sunday evening. Tomorrow on Fresh Air, we'll talk about the new wave of lobbyists in President Trump's Washington and how the chaos and uncertainty within the Trump administration have affected how lobbyists operate. My guest will be New York Times political investigative reporter Nicholas Confessori, who covers wealth, power, and influence in Washington. I hope you'll join us. Fresh Air's executive producer is into trouble. They're based on two real identical twins who I think you met, or at least you met one of them. Well, we met the character whose name is Vincent on the show, the bar owner, and um, his brother had passed, and and he actually passed away before we shot the pilot. But uh, David and I spent a good deal of time with him, and um, it was his it was his stories that and his delivery in in uh, in a way that got us interested to begin with. You know, we didn't particularly want to do a show about pornography, and we almost grudgingly took the meeting with this guy. Um, But after we spoke to him, the story started to come alive for us because he knew so many people, their arcs were so defined, and this bar that he had um, was an unusual place for for that time because, you know, at the time you had uh, segregated bars, you had the gay bars downtown, you had black bars, white bars, that kind of thing. He welcomed everybody into this place, so he knew um, uh, prostitutes, pimps, porn actors, you know, politicians, journalists, gay and straight, transgender, and he was the kind of guy that, um, although he was complicit in a lot of the things that we're going to get to on the show, uh, he had a live and let live, live attitude. So, um, and the fact that he had a brother uh, that was sort of not a bad guy, but he dragged him into a lot of bad situations, created conflict, which was, you know, natural for drama for us. So you like this guy? Um, I would say I like a good bit of him, yeah. Right. <laughs> Fair I enough. mean, the, you know, yeah. he's problematic. He was problematic in certain ways, mm-hmm. but there was a lot of charm to him, I will say. But then, you know, at the same time, there were moments where you know, he would tell us a story about somebody, and and we would say, well, well what happened to her? And, and you know, the answer was never that she married a, a podiatrist and moved to Scarsdale and had three kids. It was always the vast majority of the stories were attritive, and so you started to get that vibe as well. So um, the series is also about pornography and how pornography is changing. And I want to play a short clip here. There's a scene where one of the prostitutes, Darlene finds out that one of her Johns has kind of not only made a film of them having sex, but he sold it, and it's being sold under the counter at the local bookstore that has a lot of porn that it sells under the counter. And so she goes in to try to get her hands on one of these films and find out who's making money off of her surreptitiously like this. So here's uh, Dominique Fishback 
as Dario Lynch, an art film in a lot of ways. And then Mondo Trasho, which is a John Waters film from 1969. It's the film he made before Pink Flamingos. I think John Waters once told me that one of his dreams was... <laughs> wants to have one of his movies play in a Times Square grindhouse. Was this you making his dream come true? Partly, yeah. I mean, it, it did play in New York. I'm not sure which theater, but um, the, yeah, that was a sort of a nod to John. And um, but most of the, most of the uh, what you see in the marquees is actually what played, and the double bills are are with the exception double. of maybe Mondo Trasho. <laughs> with that exception, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> And you know, so at the time, it wasn't it wasn't just soft X's. It was, you know, grindhouse films and art films like the Bertolucci film, and we were pretty careful about that. Even, you know, to the point of making you know, some films were re released with different titles, and I always made sure that it was the original title at the at the time of the release. But you know, we went after um, realism in all aspects of the, you know, the art direction, costume cars. We really wanted to get it right. Um, the 70s films that I cut my teeth on were my favorite films. The, those time capsule, you know, movies shot in New York, locations, not sets, like French Connection, Taken to Pelham, one, two, three. Some of the black exploitation films like Black Caesar, which shot in Harlem. Um, we really wanted this to look like a film that had uh, had been shot in 71, and put away somewhere and just got rediscovered. This is where George is totally in command. Uh, nothing is more entertaining than going to an outdoor location for the deuce and watching George uh, march up and down the lines of cars until he finds the you know the 1973 El Dorado that should not be in the line for 1971. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like you know. What do you think you were going to get that opera window past me? You know, like nothing is funnier. It's it's he's you know tyrannical. It's just wonderful. George, I'm assuming it's you who chose the theme for the deuce, the Curtis Mayfield song? Yeah, good call. Um, <laughs> you know, Mayfield was a hero, personal hero of mine, just, not just for his music, but his spirituality and how he he stood up in a peaceful way to the the, uh, the horrible things that were happening to, uh, to his people at that time. And so um, that particular cut was the first track off of his uh, solo album, Curtis, the one where he's in a, wearing a lem lemon yellow suit on the cover. And it was sort of the, the shot across the bow of the uh, psychedelic funk movement. Um, and it's a great song. So it's almost like I, <laughs> I achieved a lifelong ambition to get a Curtis Mayfield song in the, uh, in the credits. It was uh, many or four, you know, the legalization of prostitution, for example, and but, you know, th there's also a lot, plenty of slavery involved in this. People coming, to, brought to this country, working off their, working off their uh, their ticket here, in the form of prostitution and against their will. And mm -hmm. um, there's not a lot positive that you can say about it after talking to folks who are in the industry. Yeah, I, I think we we tended to get more positive feedbacks from some of the survivors of, of early porn. Um, I went to a, I went to a memorial service for uh, Candida Royale, who is a early uh, adult actor and filmmaker, um, who passed away recently. And I, I met a good deal of her um, her colleagues, and I, I do remember having a conversation where I was starting to talk about, you know, what we had heard in terms of you know this bad outcome or this, you know, that that it was an attritive lifestyle. Um, and somebody, actually it was Veronica Hart, uh, it was the, the actress Veronica Hart, said, you know what, you can't generalize and be careful about generalizing because you will come across people who they made a life, they were self-actualized, they controlled their bodies, they did it their way. She made a point. She said, the only time I ever had anyone try to get me on a casting couch was in straight movies in L.A. You know, that never actually, I didn't sleep with anybody I didn't want to sleep with. Um when I was working in porn. And she was adamant that we not come up with one particular version of events. Mm -hmm. And so it made me wary. If you're just joining us, my guests are David Simon and George Pelicanos, the creators of the new HBO series, The Deuce. David Simon also created The Wire and Treme, 
Pelicanos wrote for both of those series. We're going to take a short break, and then we'll be right back. This is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from the Showtime documentary series, Active Shooter, America Under Fire. This documentary series presents a new perspective on some of the worst tragedies the U.S. has seen, including Columbine, Orlando, and Aurora. Hear firsthand personal stories from responders, survivors, and the ordinary people who performed extraordinary acts of courage. Active Shooter, America Under Fire, an eight-part documentary series, every Friday, only on Showtime. Um, The clothing is so 70s. And one thing I have to say about the clothing, um, and I don't mean to sound old-fashioned or anything, but I'll just come out and say it. I was noticing Saturday night as I was walking down a street with a lot of clubs on it that all the young women were dressed as if they were in the deuce, as if they were like the prostitutes on the on the deuce. With the what are you depicting? At the same time, and and this is really important, I think, is you're trying not to have the camera linger, as George says. You're trying to restrict the camera's uh, use as a, as a titillating agent, as 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 an exploitive agent. And so you're being really rigorous about what you're you know, you're you're, you're trying not trying to light to make it uh, uh, more erotic or more pornographic. You're not trying to uh, capture um, pornographic tableaus. Um, you're you're chasing other things with the camera. But the other thing that you cannot do is you can't merely allude to what pornography is, because if you do that, if you start getting, you don't want to be prurient, but if you're puritan as well. Now you're saying something else. Now you're cleaning it up. Now you're taking what is pornography and what its uses and purposes and intent is, and you're making it into some off-screen joke. It becomes lighthearted. Yeah, you're on your way to making Pretty Woman. And in some ways, if you're going to do a piece that is explicitly about the sexual commodification of women, that that's what it's about, then you have to show what that is. And you have to show um, what it is and be direct about the fact that that is a very coarse product and a, and a very painful. So I think there's um, more of an awareness now of sex workers as having, like, jobs. Um, you know, that sex work is a, is a job, that there's such a thing as harm reduction. So that for people who are sex workers, like, there's ways of preventing, of helping them prevent getting sick getting STDs. And I think there's more of an awareness now than there was in 1971 and more of a language for talking about that now than there was in 1971. Although in 1971, there was the beginnings of an awareness of that. So I guess I'm wondering which lens you wanted to see the story through, through the lens of today or the lens of what people were thinking in 1971 or both at the same time? Um. I think we want people to speak as they do in 1971. And again, you and I and George right now are having a discussion about theory and 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 issues and and things that if if if, if our characters were to speak this way, we would have a, a real problem. We would not have a a functional or credible narrative. That is so true. But and so I think the thing that really appealed to me, and it started to appeal to me even as we started to hear uh, this man's stories about 42nd Street, was. Here's a moment where an economy and an industry comes into being almost overnight. Uh, what isn't legal, what is furtive, what is being sold out of car trunks and, and from under counters suddenly is available. And the profit is going to increase geometrically. Through, through the lens of today or the lens of what people were thinking in 1971 or both at the same time? Um I think we want people to speak as they do in 1971. And again, you and I and George right now are having a discussion about theory and 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 issues and and things that if if if, if our characters were to speak this way, we would have a, a real problem. We would not have a a functional or credible narrative. That is so true. But and so I think the thing that really appealed to me, and it started to appeal to me even as we started to hear uh, this man's stories about 42nd Street, was. Here's a moment where an economy and an industry comes into being almost overnight. Uh, what isn't legal, what is furtive, what is being sold out of car trunks and, and from under counters suddenly is available. And the profit is going to 
increase geometrically to where now pornography is a multi-billion dollar business. So let's follow that. Let's take a look back at this moment and see who paid the cost, who was, you know, what happened to the pioneers, I mean the real pioneers. And so I think that's what is anachronistic in our heads is that, like, I think we know what was coming in terms of, of the next 30, 40 years in America. My guests are David Simon and George Pelicanos, the creators of the new HBO series, The Deuce. We'll talk more after a break. This is Fresh Air. Thanks for listening to Fresh Air. Here's another podcast you might enjoy, the TED Radio Hour. It's a show exploring new ideas and inventions, fresh approaches to old problems, and new ways to think and create. You can find the TED Radio Hour with host Guy Raz on the NPR One app or wherever you find your podcasts. So it's interesting, the time that you're writing about, 1971, which is when the deuce starts, it's all these kind of coinciding uh, movements. You, so you, you've got this, like, um, th- pornography is about to expand and enter the mainstream in a way that it never has before. At the same time, you've got the women's movement. You've got the gay rights movement. You've got the anti-war movement, um, you know, the counterculture all of this stuff is is happening at the same time, taking the culture in different directions at the same time. So how how do, do you want to address all of that simultaneity? There is one character already who <laughs> has nearly gotten fired for being against the war and for for being a college student against the war on a construction site. Yeah, I think that was a, a surrogate for actually Richard Price. <laughs> uh, being, you know, coming near to being escorted off of his father's, uh, I think he was that. I think the price. 1971. Although in 1971 there was the beginnings of an awareness of that, so I guess I'm wondering which lens you wanted to see the story through, through the lens of today, or the lens of what people were thinking in 1971, or both at the same time. Um, I, I think we wanted people to speak as they do in 1971, and again. You and I and George right now are having a discussion about theory and 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 issues and and things that if if if, if our characters were to speak this way, we would have a, a real problem. We would not have a a functional or credible narrative. That is so true. But and so I think the thing that really appealed to me, and it started to appeal to me even as we started to hear uh, this man's stories about Forty Second Street, was here's a moment where an economy and an industry comes into being almost overnight. Uh, what isn't legal, what is furtive, what is being sold out of car trunks and, and from under counters suddenly is available. And the profit is going to increase geometrically to where now pornography is a multi-billion dollar business. So let's follow that. Let's take a look back at this moment and see who paid the cost, who was, you know, what happened to the pioneers, I mean the real pioneers. And so I think that's what is anachronistic in our heads is that like I think we know what was coming in terms of of the next 30, 40 years in America. My guests are David Simon and George Pelicanos, the creators of the new HBO series, The Deuce. We'll talk more after a break. This is Fresh Air. Thanks for listening to Fresh Air. Here's another podcast you might enjoy, the TED Radio Hour. It's a show exploring new ideas and inventions, fresh approaches to old problems, and new ways to think and create. You can find the TED Radio Hour with host Guy Raz on the NPR One app or wherever you find your podcasts. So it's interesting, the time that you're writing about, 1971, which is when the deuce starts, it's all these kind of coinciding uh, movements. So you've got this, like... um, Pornography is about to expand and enter the mainstream in a way that it never has before. At the same time, you've got the women's movement. You've got the gay rights movement. You've got the anti-war movement, um, you know, the counterculture. All of this stuff is is happening at the same time, taking the culture in different directions at the same time. So how how do, do you want to address all of that simultaneity? 
There is one character already who <laughs> has nearly gotten fired for being against the war and for, for being a college student against the war on a construction site. <laughs> yeah. Of that New York, that it was, it was shot with the same tonality as if it had been made then. Yeah. And, uh, and she took that to heart. You know, that area of Times Square has always had a lot of movie marquees, you know, movie theaters. And you know, particularly in the early 70s when more people went to the movies. So uh, I'm always interested in the movies that you have on the marquees. <laughs> and, <laughs> and in episode one, among the films you have on the marquees on 42nd Street is The Conformist, which is a, a great Bernardo Bertolucci movie. And it's it's kind of like a, it's a very, very much an art film in a lot of ways. And then Mondo Trasho, which is a John Waters film from 1969. It's the film he made before Pink Flamingos. I think John Waters once told me that one of his dreams was, <laughs> was to have one of his movies play in a Times Square grindhouse. Was this you making his dream come true? Partly, yeah. I mean, it, it did play in New York. I'm not sure which theater, but um, the, yeah, that was a sort of a nod to John. And um, but most of the, most of the uh, what you see on the marquees is actually what played and the double bills are, are with the exception double. of maybe Mondo Trasho <laughs> with that exception yes <laughs> um, and you know so at the time it wasn't it wasn't just soft X's it was you know grindhouse films and art films like the Bertolucci film and we were pretty careful about that even you know to the point of making you know, some films were re- re-released with different titles and I always made sure that it was the original title at the at the time of the release but you know, we went after um, realism in all aspects of the, you know, the art direction, costume, cars. We really wanted to get it right. Um, the 70s films that I cut my teeth on were my favorite films. The, those time capsule, you know, movies shot in New York, locations, not sets, like French Connection, Taken a Pelham 1, 2, 3. Some of the black exploitation films like Black Caesar, which was shot in Harlem, um, we really wanted this to look like a film that had uh, had been shot in '71 and put away somewhere and just got rediscovered. This is where George is totally in command. Uh, nothing is more entertaining than going to an outdoor location for the Deuce and watching George uh, march up and down the lines of cars until he finds the, you know, the 1973 El Dorado that should not be in the line for 1971. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, you know, what, do you think you were going to get that opera window past me? You know, like, nothing is funnier. It's, it's, he's, you know, tyrannical. It's just wonderful. George, I'm assuming it's you who chose the theme for the Deuce, the Curtis Mayfield song? Yeah, good call. Um, <laughs> you know, Mayfield was a hero, personal hero of mine, just not just for his music, but his spirituality and how. And you know, so at the time, it wasn't it wasn't just soft X's. It was, you know, grindhouse films and art films like the Bertolucci film. And we were pretty careful about that. Even, you know, to the point of making you know, some films were re released with different titles, and I always made sure that it was the original title at the at the time of the release. But you know, we went after. Um, Realism in all aspects of the, you know, the art direction, costume, cars. We really wanted to get it right. Um, the 70s films that I cut my teeth on were my favorite films. The, those time capsule, you know, movies shot in New York, locations, not sets, like French Connection, Taken a Pelham 1, 2, 3. Some of the black exploitation films like Black Caesar, which was shot in Harlem. Um, we really wanted this to look like a film that had uh, had been shot in 71 and put away somewhere and just got rediscovered. This is where George is totally in command. Uh, nothing is more entertaining than going to an outdoor location for the Deuce and watching George uh, march up and down the lines of cars until he finds the, you know, the 1973 El Dorado that should not be in the line for 1971. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, you know... What do you think you were going to get that opera window past me? You know, like <laughs> nothing is funnier. It's it's he's you know tyrannical. It's just wonderful. George, I'm assuming it's you who chose the theme for the Deuce, the Curtis Mayfield song. Yeah, good call. Um, <laughs> you know, Mayfield was a hero, personal hero of mine. Just not just for his music, but his spirituality and how he he stood up in a peaceful way to 
the the uh, the horrible things that were happening to uh, to his people at that time, and so um, that particular cut was the first track off of his uh, solo album Curtis, the one where he's in a wearing a lem- lemon yellow suit on the cover, and it was sort of the, the shot across the bow of the uh, psychedelic funk movement, um, and it's a great song. So it's almost like I <laughs> I achieved a life long ambition to get a Curtis Mayfield song in the uh, in the credits. And of course he did the songs for Superfly which is well, probably like the most famous of the black exploitation films. You know, I uh I had an 8-track deck in my Camaro and I had um I had three 8-track tapes, you know, I was on a budget and one of them was Superfly. Uh, the other two were um Led Zeppelin 1 and Al Green's Call Me. Mm. So there mm-hmm. it is. <laughs> once on the wire, once on the wire I tried to uh, stage a comic moment to um, uh, I think it was either Superfly or it was uh, Pusher it might have been Pusher Man yeah. but uh, uh, George came to me uh, closed the door to my office and said that if I meaning if you uh, if you get on your laptop and look at porn it's basically 10 minute loops that go right to the money shot they've given up on any <laughs> art, you know aspirations for art but um it went backwards. Well, you don't yeah. you don't need that to justify it anymore. <laughs> and I don't think so. No, not I, at I all. think people watching at, at home all. they just want to kind of get to the point. If well, they, if they it, want to plot, they'll watch beca- the news. It became <laughs> a, a, I mean? it became a ve- vehicle for sexual release. I mean, mm-hmm. that ho- that moment of porn chic, when when uh, some of the people making the films uh, had this one window of believing that they were on the way to creating some some new genre of cinematic genre um, it was a very brief moment and you could probably time the end of it uh, uh, to the the arrival of, of VHS of, of videotape because at that point the entire physical plant of places like uh, the Deuce or North Beach in, in San Francisco it became irrelevant you didn't you know the, the raincoat crowd was no longer the audience the audience was the American people and by and large the American male And it was going to his living room. Well, let's take a short break here, and then we'll talk some more. If you're just joining us, my guests are the two creators of the new HBO series, The Deuce, David Simon and George Pelicanos, who have also written some of the episodes. We'll be right back. This is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast and the following message come from Swell Investing, an impact investing platform that aims to deliver profit as well as purpose. Swell identifies high growth potential companies that are working to solve today's biggest challenges like clean water, disease eradication, and renewable energy. Now people can invest in portfolios of stocks that align with their values. This is impact investing. It's also good business. Invest in progress at swellinvesting.com. So the Maggie Gyllenhaal character um, is like the only prostitute in the series, the only sex worker in the series who refuses to work with a pimp. If someone's going to pay for her services, she's going to get all the money. She's not going to give some of it to a pimp. She fills in for a woman in a porn shoot, and um, she gets very interested in how is this put together. The film that she's making, you know, that she's appearing in, this porn short, it's such a ridiculous film. It's like the women have blonde braids and they're kissing each other and then naked Vikings walk in. So the naked, <laughs> naked guys walk in with Viking helmets and horns coming out of the helmets. Um, well, it is, it is called Great Dane in the Morning. So. <laughs> 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 yes, porn, porn always has great titles. Um, so anyways, were, were most of the f- – did you watch a lot of porn films of the era – and were they mostly as re- um you know i mean i think in retrospect now looking back on on what pornography has become in 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 american life how ubiquitous it is and what is at a 10 or 12 or 14 year old kids fingertips now on the internet um that's interesting to me the idea of how blunt and and how uh, frankly, misogynistic a certain portion of that por- pornography is, and how available it is, um, because it was all, uh, you know, it, whether it was pornographic or or erotic or anything, it was all f- weirdly forbidden, if that's a word. When I was a, when I was a teenager, it was 
you know, I mean, I don't think I saw, George, I'm speaking for myself, but I don't think I saw a porn loop until I was 18 or 19. You know, I had to, I had to be of age to walk into a dirty book. That's right. Your turn, That's George. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Give it up, George. <laughs> uh you know, it wasn't it wasn't a big part of my life. I can tell you that. I mean, we had theaters in D.C. Uh, we'd go, you know, I'd go down there with buddies of mine occasionally and and check it out. But you knew what what it was. I mean, it was you weren't looking for production values, um, <laughs> and and that's that's pretty much the case of all the exploitation movies I used to see, and you know, uh, the, the karate films, black exploitation. You know, it was just it was another way to have fun. Um, grindhouse. Yeah. yeah, grindhouse. I mean. But I didn't, I didn't think about it that much, and I didn't, and I sure didn't think about, you know, in the back of my mind, I might, I might have thought, well, that's somebody's daughter, or that's somebody's sister, you know, and, uh, but that was the extent of my, um, you know, my self reflection. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I have to say, in this cheap movie that we're talking about, within the Deuce, the money shot is executed with the help of. Campbell's <laughs> potato soup. <laughs> can I, is that can a real I just thing? Say, is that a real thing that happened? Is that you know, like based on Price, research? Yeah. <laughs> Richard Price wrote that. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he researched it. Apparently, um, apparently, it was an early remedy. Uh, if 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 the male performers had performed uh, too quickly, um, it was uh, it was a substitution. And uh, and he put that in there, and um, it stood the test of time. It made it through about three generations of scripts, <laughs> and uh, the cast and crew managed to execute it in such a way that it, it did speak to the amateurishness. And also, bluntly, it spoke to what people were chasing when they were when they were buying pornography. And mm-hmm. and and I don't think early pornography certainly took a lot of its tropes from mainstream film. And, and played with them, um, it's it's gone the other way. And now, I mean, I think, you know, for everything from fashion to uh, to music to, 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 to regular cinema, um, the, the pornographication of America uh, has been profound. I mean, you don't, listen, you don't have a multi-billion dollar industry operating every year and not have it transform the way we think about ourselves and each other. And I don't think anyone's got a good handle on 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 the depth of that, I, th- I think it's happened so fast, and it's been so unexamined, so w- without any. I don't think anyone's examined it with any degree of seriousness. That I'm, I'm not sure we know what we've built. I feel like we can't let this interview end without talking about Taxi Driver for a moment, <laughs> because <laughs> might tra- as well. Yeah, Travis Bickle's always driving through his taxi past Times Square, probably past some of the same locations that you're trying to summon up even though you didn't shoot on location because Times Square looks nothing like it used to and there's right. no way of there's no way of changing that. But there's one shot in particular from episode 1 where I thought okay that's Travis walking down the street. It's um um James Franco is Vincent walking down the street and you see all the movie marquees and there's lights behind him and I thought like that is direct quote from Taxi Driver. Yes. I think Michelle uh did a remarkable job. Uh, Michelle McLaren of directing the pilot and 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 her finale for the first season, I think she went into a room with every single New York film from the seventies. You know, I think in that sequence you not only have uh, references to Taxi Driver. I think when you see Saturday his, Night his Live, shoes, uh, Saturday Night Fever, <laughs> exactly, you yeah. see his shoes on the pavement. Yeah, um, it was her first chance to shoot something in New York, and George gave her the note that we wanted this thing to feel like it was found in a vault having been made in 1971 that it wasn't the 2017 version of that New York that it was it was shot with the same tonality as if it had been made then yeah and uh, and she took that to heart you know that area of Times Square has always had a lot of movie marquees you know movie theaters and you know, particularly in the early 70s when more people went to the movies so uh, I'm always interested in the movies that you have on the marquees. <laughs> and, <laughs> and in episode one, among the films you have on the marquees on 42nd Street is The Conformist, which is a, a great Bernardo Bertolucci movie. And it's, it's kind of like a, it's a very, very much an art film in a lot of ways. 
And then Mondo Trasho, which is a John Waters film from 1969. It's the film he made before Pink Flamingos. I think John Waters once told me that one of his dreams was... <laughs> <laughs> was to have one of his movies play in a Times Square grindhouse. Was this you making his dream come true? Partly, yeah. I mean, it, it did play in New York. I'm not sure which theater.